Back in 1895, the Earl's court wheel with its rim drive pushed the sky wheel to new heights. But it would be a century before big wheels would rise again. To build the 135 meter tall London Eye, engineers would have to find a way of giving passengers a perfect panorama. London at the turn of the millennium. The city needs a monument fit to mark the next 1,000 years. Architect David Marks draws up plans for an iconic structure that fires public imagination. London didn't have a publicly accessible viewing platform. Our idea was to provide London with a vantage point so that people could appreciate the views over the city in the same way that people can appreciate views over Paris or New York, you know, with the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building. The vantage point will take the form of a huge new observation wheel called the London Eye. After 100 years out of favor, this could be the rebirth of the sky wheel. Engineers construct the wheel flat on temporary islands in the middle of the River Thames. The team then use a huge crane to lift it upright. Half of London turned out to see it go up. And it was a phenomenal sight when that happened. I think it was, and probably still is, the largest object that was ever lifted from the horizontal to the vertical. With the wheel in position, engineers must now fit the passenger capsules. Their design is critical. The view out must be unrivaled. But there's a problem with traditional passenger cabins. On early observation wheels, cabins hang from pivots attached to the outer rim. The cabins can swing freely, so as the wheel rotates, gravity keeps them level. But at the top of the wheel, when the scenery should be at its best, the struts of the rim block the view. This isn't good enough for the designer of the London Eye. The other thing we wanted to do is to make sure that when you got to the top of the wheel, you really were on the top of the wheel, so you weren't suspended from gimbals underneath a structure. And so the idea was to put the, the capsules on the outside of the wheel. This had never been done before. A lot of innovation went into putting the pods on the outside, but in fact, we're using a lot of standard components, just putting them together in a different way, and using technology in a new way. The real challenge for David Marks and his engineers is finding a way to keep his glass capsules level as the wheel turns. If he simply bolts them to the outside of the rim, as the London Eye revolves, so will the floor of the passenger capsules, with predictable results. So his engineers sit the capsule inside two large rings mounted on bearings. Within these rings, the capsule can rotate freely. The engineers attach the rings to the rim of the London Eye. As the wheel revolves, the capsule is free to turn. It's 5 a.m. in London. While the city sleeps, 
maintenance engineers oil the bearings that keep the capsules turning smoothly. But working out how to actually drive the capsules around has designers scratching their heads. They could let them hang freely and rely on gravity to keep them upright. But this would only work if they installed a one-ton counterweight at the base of each capsule. That would make them far too heavy. The solution they come up with is hidden beneath the capsule floor. An electric motor drives a set of gears that rotates the capsule around. The speed of the motor is synchronized with the speed of the wheel, so the floor remains level all the way round. The tilting floor gives passengers a solid base beneath their feet. And the way the capsules sit on the outside of the wheel gives them the best possible view in every direction. North, south, east and west can be found clearly marked above the ground. Finally, to make sure passengers enjoy the view without interruption, Designer David Marks takes another bold decision. He wants his wheel to never stop turning. If you could turn it continuously, it wouldn't be like the old Ferris wheels, which sort of juddered to a halt every time you needed to fill a cabin. And that would also be a beautiful symbol to commemorate the millennium with something that represented regeneration and continuity and the cycles of life. But getting passengers on and off a moving wheel has never been done before. So engineers must solve one last puzzle. How fast can they safely turn the London Eye? The speed at which the wheel rotates was arrived at by testing. We knew that we wanted it to turn continuously, that we needed to get people in and out of the capsules. So we, we built a, a mock-up. In their factory in a small village in the south of France, manufacturers mount one of the London Eye's capsules on rails. We, we pulled it along the factory floor. The entire village turned out and moved in and out of this pot. We tried different speeds and different step heights and widths and, until we got it right. The tests show that passengers start falling over if the platform moves above two kilometers per hour. Thanks to these French villagers, passengers move on and off the London Eye comfortably, and London has a wheel that never stops turning. The London Eye forms the centerpiece of the city's millennium celebrations on New Year's Eve 1999. It is supposed to be pulled down after five years. But it proves so popular with tourists and locals alike that 10 years on, this big wheel just keeps on turning. The innovations pioneered on the London Eye set the benchmark for observation wheels around the world. Just like the London Eye, the Singapore Flyer turns continuously and has capsules mounted on the outside of its rim. But the capsule designers on the Singapore Flyer face a problem not experienced in London. It's midday. Temperatures reach a blistering 35 degrees Celsius and 80% humidity. I'm doing something which very few Singaporeans would do. I'm choosing to stand outside as it approaches midday, and I can confirm it is very hot and very humid. 
people who are going to get into those capsules, there's a further complication because we're going to take 28 people, crowd them together and put them into a mobile greenhouse. The capsules must be made of glass to give passengers the best view. But the glass also traps the heat of the equatorial sun. This could make conditions inside dangerously hot. To prevent the passengers being roasted alive, the designers install four powerful air conditioning units in each capsule. As the units suck warm air from the cabin and cool it down, water vapor in the air condenses and turns to liquid. The resulting dry, cold air is then blown in at the top of the capsule, cooling the passengers. But in just one hour, this process generates 32 liters of water. At this rate, after just one day, every capsule would be carrying nearly half a ton of extra weight. This poses a problem for engineers. Their solution is to jettison this extra weight at the end of every revolution. Every complete cycle, we empty the water into the rainforest environment so the water is not wasted, it's actually used. But by keeping passengers cool, engineers risk ruining their view. Imagine this glass as the capsule, which is about the same temperature as the hot, moist air. But I'm going to pour some iced water into it and cool the glass rapidly. So let's try that. So the glass is now cooling down to the temperature of the iced water and the air as it blows past it is being cooled as well and you can see it's already starting to mist up. To combat this, engineers in the control office at the base of the flyer check each capsule for condensation as it comes round. If the glass is misting up, they can adjust the temperature of each capsule individually. Raising the temperature by a couple of degrees is enough to keep the windows clear. By making sure the temperature is just right, engineers keep passengers comfortable without spoiling the view.